Hi everyone and welcome to week five query optimization. So we've talked a little bit about SQL and SQL queries and how databases are created and one of the next things that we are going to be talking about is how queries can be optimized so that they can run faster. So some of the first things that we have to think about is how queries are done queries will have plans. They will also have times that they take to run. Each query has a time that it takes to execute. Each query has a plan, which is the steps the database is using to give you the results. Different queries will have different plans and those different plans will affect the time that it takes. Based on how that query is being put together, we can actually have drastic differences in the amount of time that it will take for the query to give you the results that you're looking for. Some databases, and really a lot of the modern databases, actually have a built-in way to see the plan for the query. And when you look at the plan for the query, you'll be able to see how it's being put together and you will be able to start seeing some suggestions. Some databases will actually even have some suggestions for how you could put the query together in a different and more efficient way. Query optimization is how we can make queries more efficient. Now, this is something that is much more useful once you start getting into larger databases in industry. When we're talking about some of the smaller databases that you've been seeing so far and working with so far, it's honestly not that much of a difference because query optimization with really simple queries is basically kind of silly because like, there's not really that many ways that it could actually be put together. So like when you have a table that's got, you know, like 10 records or two tables with 10 records each and then you join them, like it doesn't really matter because everything is so fast. Those like tenths of a second or hundredths of a second, it really doesn't matter. But that's not true once we start getting into much more complex situations. When we start getting into more real world data where it isn't 10 records or even a thousand records or 10,000 records, we could be looking at a million records or more than a million records. We could be looking at a whole bunch of different tables. So we're not just joining two tables, we're joining like seven different tables in different ways. Um, these larger sets of data, more tables, more things that we're looking at, this is where we really start to see the power of query optimization. Um, simple queries, there isn't much to be done. It just, it is what it is. Um, we can do some database tuning that can change things a little bit, but it's really when we start to see these like very large amounts of real world data that query optimization becomes really important. Now, some databases do have built in optimizers. So they will actually have suggestions like, you know, hey, have you thought about putting your query together this way or joining your tables that way? Because you can actually sort of come about those problems in different ways and have different queries once we start getting into much more complex stuff. So, um, you know, for example, if you are looking at a database and it's got, you know, 100 records of magic cards, well, eh, even if it's, you know, all of the magic cards that are being released in this year and it's, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever, eh. But if we're looking at a database that say um, all patients in a large hospital chain organization, it will be useful. Query optimizers um, should not just be blindly trusted. Uh, a lot of the optimizers will have suggestions. They might be reasonable suggestions. You might even see them starting to use some AI for suggestions because AI actually can be used to help you write queries and make you give you suggestions for how to write more efficient queries. But you can't just trust them blindly. You have to make sure that what they're suggesting actually makes sense, actually works, and actually is an improvement. Don't just assume that the computer knows better than you do. It doesn't always.
We need optimization because in the real world, we're generally dealing with very large data sets and very complex queries. If we are talking about, you know, a million patients in a hospital and we're looking at all of the different records and we need to run a really complex report, then every second will count. And even if we're talking about something like tenths of a second, it can actually really count and really add up. It is absolutely possible to create queries that will take a really long time to run. And you could have a query that might end up running for a couple of hours, depending on the size of your database and how many records it has to go through, how many tables it has to join together, stuff like that. You can have queries that will, you know, maybe you run them overnight type of thing. It's also possible that you have queries being run so frequently, and that's a different problem. Because then even if your query is only taking, you know, five minutes to give you the result, but you have to run three queries every minute, that's still going to end up taking more time than you were really hoping for. The more complex you get with queries, the larger you get with data sets, the more you'll see optimization being really important. So once you start getting into any variety of database usage in industry for larger companies, you'll start to see this. Again, this might not be relevant if you're working for a very small company, 100 employees, a um, thousand, you know, customers type of thing. It's not really a big deal. It's when we're talking about these really big data sets with lots of lots of uh, tables, complex things that we're doing. Okay, so where do we start? Indexes. We are starting with indexes because it's a really good frontline defense. Um, indexes are one of the first things that we'll end up starting with for optimization because the assumption is that um, if you haven't already done an index, this is kind of the biggest bang for your buck. An index is how we can start working with our very, very large data sets and databases and make it a little faster for us to go through them. An index will actually have us copy some columns of data so that we can get the information faster. You could think of it like a map or a blueprint. You could also think of it like a cheat code. If you've ever played some of the um, early Mario games, you might remember that they have like the hidden level. And if you beat the hidden level, you actually get to skip ahead to world eight. Um, indexes will usually have a way to refer back to the original data. So that direct link or direct path. Now, the next example I'm going to do um, is actually a library card index. Um, I, I fully understand that you may not have never seen one of these, so just, just go with me on this. It's actually a really good example. I also know how this is going to sound, and I'm sorry um, for basically all of the young people that are listening to this. Um, when I was growing up in the Dark Ages, uh, the way the libraries actually organized their books was they had all of the books on the shelves, but in the front of the library, they had this card system. And they would have all of these very, very deep drawers. And those drawers would have little index cards with uh, the title, the author, the publication date, some of that really important information of that book written on that card. And then they would alphabetize that by author so that you could go through and say like, oh, well, I know I'm looking for, you know, Tolkien, so I'm going to go to the T's, and then I'm going to flip through these index cards to be able to find Tolkien, and then that will have a reference of where the actual book is, and it will tell you, like, Tolkien is in fiction, and it's on, you know, shelf two um, in row five, or, you know, whatever it was. And so that index card will actually give you all of the information that you need for that book and tell you where that book is in the library. Um, and if you're thinking like, oh, why didn't you just use a computer? Yeah, we didn't have computers. I know, just bypass that. Um, we had pieces of paper. 
that's just how that worked. But that's actually how indexing works for a database is it's copying some of the information so that we can refer back to it and say like, oh, well, I actually want this book, this book lives at, and then you can go find it instead of having to go through the shelves, um, you know, shelf by shelf, book by book to find the thing you want and walk through the entire library. You could find it all in that index system. Index basics. So we can tell that an index might be useful if you look at your query plan and you see that the scan is going through each record in sequence. When you say each record in sequence, it's like if you had all of the authors in a row and you're like, um, you know, author A, are you Tolkien? No. Moving on to author B, are you Tolkien? No, moving on to author C. And you can see how long that would take if you have to ask every single author in the A's and then every single author in the B's, like, you know, hey, are you Tolkien? That might be a good place to have an index. Indexes can be created on any column. So I was using the example of author, but you could absolutely organize the books or you know, whatever it is in a different way. Um, you could organize, let's say, patient records. Instead of organizing them by patient, you could organize them by doctor. You could organize them by insurance. You could organize them by birthday. doesn't matter. Um, you can also use a partial index. Um, and the partial index or filtered index, so you can actually include part of the rows as well. And that's another way that you can actually go about doing this. So the example that I was using is like, let's say you wanted to track a shipment in the warehouse. You don't want ordered, you don't want shipped, you don't want delivered. We just want to track things that are currently in the warehouse. And so you would actually be looking for that as well. So it's not just, does it have a status in the, you know, is it shipped category? It's, does it have a status that matches in the warehouse? So what kind of changes can we expect? What are our improvements? So the sequential search or linear search um, is where we went through every single author and we were like, hey, are you Tolkien? No? Cool. Um, and went through it one by one. A binary search actually makes it so that we can get to the author a lot quicker. The index creation will depend on the time of the table. So we actually have to run a command or set of commands, depending, um, to create the index for the table. That index creation will take an amount of time based off of the size of the table and the amount of records in the table. Indexes themselves can actually take a lot of space. So if we go back to my, you know, old person library example, those index cards actually took up an entire like wall in the library. So like when you would first walk in through the doors, you would actually see this entire like wall of little drawers filled with index cards for all of the books that were in the entire library. Um, so it actually took up its, you know, sort of own set of space. But using this indexing method will actually change from a sequential search into a tree search. So a sequential search is, you can see like in this one, we're looking for J. Is A J? No, move on to B. Is B J? No, move on to C. Whereas with binary search, we're actually saying like, does J come before or after L? So we've actually cut our search in half because rather than going through it one by one, we've gone halfway through and said like, do you come before or after? And then we can do half of the half, which is where we'll ask F, hey, does F come before or after J? And you can see these like half options um, will actually give us the ability to find things a lot faster. Now I have a warning here. Technically, you can actually do something called multi-column indexes. So we're talking about indexes so far and we're talking about indexes on a column such as author in our database. Technically, you can have multi-column indexes, but Multi-column indexes will increase the time it takes to add new rows to your database. So if you are doing a lot of IO or input output on your database, um, that can be a real problem. 
if there's not a lot of changes, it may not be as much of a problem. But the first thing that you should ask yourself, if a multi-column index seems to be the solution, can you change your schema? So we remember schema from the week before is how the database is put together and that image of how the tables are related to each other, what's in each of the tables, and how we can potentially see the relationship between all of those tables. So if possible, ask yourself, can I revise the schema instead of doing a multi-column index? If we continue with my library index card example, this would be like if we had all of these as index cards that had all of the books in the entire library written down, then all of these index cards would be sorted by author. And then once we got to the author, it was then sorted by something else, such as title. Um, this, you know, it, I'm not saying that you can't do this. I'm just saying, make sure you sort of have some really good logic behind why you're doing this because you may end up paying a price that you weren't expecting. And if you have a database that does have a lot of IO, that might actually be literally worse than if you changed your schema. So like if you have, you know, patients in a hospital, patients come in and out of a hospital all the time. We add patients, we take away patients, patients move, um, patients get referrals, like that database is changing a lot. So it's probably not the way to go and changing your schema is probably a better idea. Okay, different types of indexes, because there are different types, may have pros and cons. Different types of indexes will use different data structures internally. Now, I'm not going to talk a ton about data structures. You're going to, if you do any other programming, you're probably going to hear about data structures there. Mostly, the database will make the choice for you. So you're not really saying like, oh, I want to use this data structure. The database is just like, yeah, no, you're using this one. Hope that's what you wanted. Um, so some types, they might have clustered indexes, hash indexes, bitmap indexes, filtered indexes, stuff like that. Some are actually only available on some databases. So like, for example, bitmaps are only available on Oracle. Now, for the most part, this is just a hey, by the way, just so that you know, because for the most part, the database is just to be like, oh, you want to create an index? Okay, well, I'm going to do that. And you're not actually going to see how it did it. It's kind of happening in the background where you don't really have that kind of control over it. But it is worth knowing that different indexes will use different data structures um, and it will depend on the type of database. And so if you are in the position of being able to pick the database that you're using for your database creation, this might be something that you would want to think about. Does this database work? This could be a pro or a con for if this is the correct database type for you. A lot of times in industry, this has actually already been made for you. Um, the company that you're working for has already made the database. Um, and even if you have to do like a massive redesign, they're probably not wa willing to walk away from the sort of database brand that they're using. So it doesn't come up that much, but you should still know that it, it is out there. Indexes will have these different data structures. The different databases will also likely have different names. So one of the things that will make this a little bit more confusing is if you do anything in computer science, you might have seen some of these names for data structures and they're not gonna match what the database calls them. They're the same data structure. They were just like, oh yeah, no, I, I don't wanna call it that anymore. I'm gonna call it something else. So um, some popular Im implementations are hashes and trees. Um, so balanced binary search trees and B plus trees specifically, um, but they will sometimes call them something else. Most databases create the index based on the primary key. So we already know that each table has a primary key, but it is also possible that you might create an index for foreign keys. That's reasonable. It's also that there's a concept of something called a covering index, where what you need is actually in the index, so you don't have to go to the record. So like, if you needed to know um, when Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, it's possible that the index card for Tolkien would actually have a notation of when The Hobbit was published on the card. Now, 
one of the things that is sort of the most important about implementation, there are no standards. So you can't just say like, oh, well, the standard for index implementation is. There isn't one. Uh, kind of different databases will do it in different ways and you get what you get. Best wishes for that. Um, and there's not really that much that you would do about it. You just, it's important that you know that it's there and you know that like they are, what the index is, how it works, why it works, why it's more efficient, um, and that they do use data structures to do them. Okay, how to tell if it's an improvement. So when you have your query, you'll see that your query plan will potentially change once you change your query. Alternative plans and the cost of your query can actually be a hard problem to solve. Um, a lot of the modern databases will actually give you your query plan. You might be able to see the execution time of your query and being able to figure out like, is it possible to make this query more efficient? Can I optimize this query? Um, maybe the suggestions will help, maybe they won't, but that's how you can tell if there is an improvement. If you notice that the query plan has changed and the execution time changes. Now, an important note, execution time isn't necessarily the most important metric to look at um, because it's completely possible that you have your query, you think you've optimized it, and you're like, okay, well, I had this query and it used to take four hours to run, but I'm really hoping to get it down to three hours. And then you fix up your plan and you pat yourself on the back for doing a great query optimization. And then it comes back in five minutes. The likelihood that you took your query from four hours to five minutes versus the likelihood that you took your query that worked and turned it into a query that didn't, I will let you figure out by yourself. Um, but I think you can guess which one it probably was. So you just do want to be careful how you're doing your optimization. Um, at this point in time, hardware, frankly, is not your issue. Disk space is cheap. Adding more servers isn't always the solution. Now, that... It is possible it is a solution. If you have this like, you know, really rinky dink server or somebody really under provisioned something, it's completely possible. Hardware is actually the issue and you have to go to budgeting to go fix that. But most of the time, it's not. You can't break, bake your bread faster with more ovens. You know, you can't say like, oh, well, I'm really not happy that my pizza takes 10 minutes to reheat. So I'm going to have 10 ovens instead of one oven for this one pizza. You know what I'm saying? Um, you can have other metrics for success as well. Uh, user feedback is what I'm going to call it. So you can have like how many users complained about load times. Um, you know, users complained a lot about how slow their shopping was. So if you have a serious uptick, so like, let's say you work for um, a company that has a database of inventory and they have an online shop. And you notice one day that you have a serious uptick in customers saying, I was searching for my, you know, I don't know, unicorn lamp. And I, it was taking, you know, minutes to load all of my unicorn lamp options. And I'm used to it taking seconds to load. So that could be a clear metric. Maybe there's something going wrong in the database. Maybe, you know, some update happened. You know, maybe something else happened. But um, that can be one of the metrics that you can use. How long the query takes to run can be variable that it may not be the best indicator. It might be, but it may not be. You could also look for things like CPU usage and input output or IO um, and the changes there. You could also look at how understandable your query is um, and how understandable that plan, that query plan is for future people. Some people like to, you know, look at that as a metric as well um, because they are going to care a lot about like you know how easy the query is to understand versus how sort of fast because it's possible that you could maybe make your query you know a minute faster but the query is so complex and fragile that if anybody does anything to it including breathe on it it will stop working um, that might not be worth the minute you know so it's things that you might want to take into consideration as you're doing your optimization. Um, 
you also want to think about the time saved. So is this a query that will be running frequently? Is this a query that, um, you know, you do quarterly, yearly? How much time are you saving by doing this upfront cost? Because query optimization has the potential to take a little bit of time and effort. And this may or may not be a high priority. It's possible you have other things you're working on. It's possible you have a whole bunch of tech debt that you have to deal with. It's possible you have projects come in, in at you. And so you have to think about, does it take more time to fix this query or to just allocate a little extra time and you don't run it overnight or something? If it's a query that runs yearly, maybe it doesn't matter so much. If it's a query that you have to run daily, however, adding in the extra upfront time to make it more optimized very well might be worth it. Um, you also want to think about what's reasonable. And this, this might seem obvious, but you have to stay within the bounds of reality. And um, I know that this is going to be really sad for many people out there. Um, I'm not saying anything about project managers and bosses. Um, but you have to think about what actual reality will let you do and what is reasonable. And so you have to ask yourself, is this goal that I have for my query optimization reasonable in the real world? You know, it might be possible to take a four hour query and get it down to a two hour query. Maybe it's possible to take a four hour query and get it into a five minute query. Like, I don't know, but whatever. Um, but make sure that that is actually reasonable. Um, and then last, is the slowness of the query something outside of your control? Do you have other options? So is the query running really slowly because, you know, everybody is trying to access this one under provision database all at the same time? So like, for example, uh, let's say that you were working on a database and there was a bunch of accountants. And you know that there are quarterly taxes. So every quarter, um, you know, these queries that you had nicely optimized um, into taking 10 minutes are now taking three hours. But that's not really something in your control because the optimization of the query isn't the problem. It's the number of people running things sort of at that same time that's an issue. So is there another option? Can you run that report after hours? Can you create less reports? Um, do you really need everything in the report that you're talking about? Is the query giving you more information that you needed? Is there, you know, sort of other choices? Um, so that's something else that you can think about as you're looking at query optimization and sort of what makes sense for it. So hopefully that was helpful for query optimization and indexing, and I hope you are all having a lovely week.